As you're seated, take your Bible. Let's go to Malachi's book, Malachi chapter 3. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. We'll, we'll start reading there in verse 6, and we'll go through verse 12. Remind you, Malachi is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God is speaking through him, his messenger, to the people of God. They're post-exile. They've returned to Israel after having been in Babylon and exile. God had spit them out of the land because of their sin, but God now has brought them back. And they are experiencing all the already and not yet of, of God's promises, that they're back in the land, but they have not experienced all the things that God has promised. And they're not living very faithfully because of it. They're frustrated with the Lord. And so what God is doing through Malachi is to calling them to repentance, calling them back to himself. We've, we've seen as we've worked through the book, God has spoken about their worship and about their leadership and about the ways they, they trust his word or believe his word, the ways they treat each other. And, and today we're moving in as he speaks about the way that they give to him, the way that they are faithful or rather unfaithful in their, in their tithes and in their offerings before the Lord. This is the, the fifth out of six charges that God has, has brought. We'll look at the sixth one here in a couple weeks, but let's look beginning in verse six, Malachi chapter three, beginning in verse six. Malachi writes by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby, thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the, hev- the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil, and your vine the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight says the Lord of hosts. Will man rob God? Central question of the text. In fact, the the grammar really leads to to us to understand it is he's asking, is it even possible for man to rob God? Conservative estimates estimate that every year something around $62 billion dollars is stolen from churches. Somewhere between 6 and 10% of all money given to churches is $62 billion is a conservative estimate. That every year, $62 billion is lost. It's given to churches and is stolen by either theft or fraud or embezzlement. That, that number, I, I knew that that number would be high. I was shocked by that number even as I looked it up this week. It does so. When you hear that, that $62 billion is stolen from churches, there's probably a reaction that you have. You know, we, we know intuitively that it's wrong to steal, that it is wrong to take something that doesn't belong to you. I think part of the, the human nature in us, the image of God in us, is that we know even in our own heart when things are wrong. You can go to any, any culture and any place in the planet, really throughout all humankind, and they will know if this belongs to me and you take it, I don't like that. We know that stealing from other people, taking something that doesn't belong to you is is wrong, and yet the thought of stealing from God feels even worse to us. It's bad enough to steal from other people. It's bad enough to steal from your fellow image bearers, to steal from man, but but to steal from God, $62 billion a year. It it is mind-boggling to think that people would have the audacity to steal from the church. But in fact, if you think about that number, as large as it may seem, the truth is, the reality is much worse than that. Because a theft has happened in not just most churches or not just many churches in the world. I I think that there has been money stolen from every church in the world. That there has been a theft that has happened at every church, including this one. Now, before you look to Kara as our business manager or Scott as the executive pastor, or you start trying to figure out who's on the finance team, 
I, I think the theft is not money that someone gave, that someone broke in and stole. The theft is this, money that the Lord called you to give that you did not give. And the fact that even as we hear that, we feel a sense of relief tells us we think that to be a lesser sin. Which is why we need this text. That God writes to the people of God and says, would you rob me? Would you take from me what rightfully belongs to me? That he's calling them to faithfulness in their tithes and their offerings. That the, the charge is this, that they would honor God by obedience and giving. If you remember the question that we have asked nearly every week as we worked through this is, how do we wait on the Lord? As we're waiting for the promises of God to come in their fullness, how do we do this faithfully? They have failed at nearly every point. And God has been having to tell them, this is how you are to live as you wait for the promises. You're to trust my love. You're to show honor to my name. You're to trust your shepherds and act faithfully. You're to, to act justly and to trust my justice. And so now he's coming to this last one and saying, you're to honor me even with your tithes and offerings, with your with your money, with your resources. You're to live faithfully. The command is very simply this. Don't rob God. He says, is it possible that man could rob God? And then he says, yes, you are robbing me. You are robbing me in your tithes and offerings. They have failed to live up to their covenant obligations. They are in covenant with God, and they have failed to obey the very things that God has called them to do, and they are unfaithful then in their tithes and offerings. And God is calling them to faithfulness. Don't rob me in your tithes and offerings. This is, though we, we sit some 200 or 2,500 years downstream of Israel in Malachi's day, this is still a call to faithfulness that we need to hear today then we need to be reminded what it looks like to live faithfully before the Lord lest we find ourselves guilty of robbing God, of taking from him what rightfully belongs to him, and taking what does not belong to us. We need to hear what the Lord says. He's saying, how do you walk faithfully as you wait for my promises? Don't rob me. What does that look like? Number one, we ought to give freely to the Lord. Did you notice in the text that as God is calling them to, and charging them that they have robbed him, the, the issue is in their tithes and contributions. This, the, the language their tithes and contributions refers specifically to the stipulations that God has given them throughout the covenant. Way back in Moses' day, in the Mosaic covenant, God had given them specific requirements for how they were to tithe. You go back, you read Deuteronomy chapter 12 or 14 or Numbers 18. God has called them to give a tithe, literally to give 10% of what they have, whether that's the grain of their fields or, or the, the sheep that they have or their wine or their flocks, that whatever they have, they're to give a tithe and an offering to the Lord. And it was a percentage of what God had given to them. They, they give this offering to the Lord as acknowledgement that God is their king that they are vassals. They belong to him. He is their king, thus they are to, to tithe. This tithe that they would give, these tithes and contributions, though there were other ways that they offered to the Lord, other tithes, other ways they gave to the Lord. This was the, the main one that they gave. It provided for the priests and the Levites. It was one of the ways that they were able to live and to be sustained. They didn't have land like the other, uh, like the other tribes that, that God had said to the Levites, you are, are not going to have land like them for I am your inheritance. And so by their tithes and contributions, they provided for the priests and the Levites to live and to minister in the temple. They provided for the feast and the celebrations that God had called them to celebrate, that, that when they gathered together as the people of God, like we just saw uh, in, second, in First Chronicles, rather, as David talks about the feasting and the celebrating, there was the tithes and the offerings that provided for that, that the people could, could gather together around the Lord and to celebrate what God had done for them. It, it provided for the poor in their community, that, that one of the ways that the, the Israelites looked out for the poor who were needy was by helping them through the tithes and contributions that God had called them to give. That God had called them to freely give. God, God is not extracting these things from them, but to freely give to them out of the overflow of what God has given to them. That they are to give these tithes and offerings at a base, 10% of all that, that they had, whether that was grain or wine or flocks, whatever they had, they were to give it to the Lord. Now, even as we come to this text, we have to ask the question, well, what, what does this have to do with us? who live on the other side of the cross, who, who live not as Israelites living back in Jerusalem in the Old Covenant, but as Christians who live in Frankfort, Kentucky, 2,500 years after this, those who live under the New Covenant, not under the Old Covenant. What, what does this have to do with us? How are we to understand this instruction for tithing that is given in the Old Testament? What does it mean for New Covenant believers? 
It's an important question that we have to ask, and we'll work through this as we, we think about that. But it is important for us to note here at the beginning that we are not under the Mosaic law, that the law has been fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the instructions given to Israel in a one-to-one sense don't apply to us, that they, they are under the law in a way that we are not under the law, that Jesus has fulfilled the law. We are under the new covenant, the, this covenant of grace by the Lord Jesus Christ. I know anytime we, we talk about tithing, by the way, we, we don't talk about money here very often, largely because we, we want to be careful lest anyone think that we're trying to extract dollars from people our goal, and any time we talk about money, is to say what the text says, because our goal in this is not financial, but is discipleship. It is to help you to be faithful with everything you have, whether that's your money or your time or your effort or your marriage or your job or your children, whatever you have, we want you to be faithful before the Lord. When we talk about tithe, the first question that's going to come to your mind is probably this. Well, if they were to give 10% in the Old Testament, are we supposed, if we give freely to the Lord, does that mean we're supposed to give Now as believers, 10% in the New Testament. It's the question pastorally that comes up. Anytime someone has a question about tithing, that's the question. What percentage am I supposed to give? Often, that is coming from an attitude of, I'd like to, what's the lowest percentage I can get away with, right? If they gave 10 in the Old Testament, I'm under the New Covenant, what does that mean for us? It's very simply, there's a lot of principles we're going to see here as we work through the text, but, but simply, I'll say this at the front end. We are no longer under the Mosaic Covenant. We are no longer under the same stipulations of the law that were in the Old Testament. So I would argue that in the New Testament, there is no strict percentage that is given to believers. There's, we're not required to give in the same way that we were, that the Old Testament believers were, a, a particular percentage. But what I think we'll see is that the principles of giving laid out in the Old Testament are a pretty good place to start for us who live in the New Covenant. That in fact, what we see often in the New Testament is the Lord himself taking the stipulations of the Old Testament, of the Old Covenant, and not denigrating them, but actually enhancing them. So if you look at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you've heard it said, don't murder. And what does Jesus say? But I tell you, don't even hate him. What is that doing? It's taking the stipulation of the Old Testament and Jesus saying it's harder than you thought. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. Jesus says, but I say unto you, don't even lust after woman in your heart, for if you have, you've already committed adultery. What has he done? He has taken the stipulation from the Old Testament, and he said, it's even harder than you thought. So I think we could understand that all that God says to his people in the Old Testament about giving, that the principles he lays out there are a pretty good place for us to start in the new covenant, understanding what does it mean for us to be faithful with the Lord. I want you to know that my my goal is to say what the text says. It's to help us to be faithful with everything that God has given. Uh, If there's one thing I would tell you at the very beginning of this text, is that what I want you to see throughout the instruction that God gives to them, that the primary concern in the text is not money. Primary concern is not monetary value. The primary concern in the text is faithfulness to the Lord. What God is after is not primarily their money. What, What is God after? Them. He is calling them back into relationship with us. So as we think about what it means to give and to be faithful in our giving as New Testament believers, the the goal is that we would be faithful to the Lord. And so what are some of the principles that we see laid out in the text that help us to think through what what it means to give as New Testament, New Covenant believers? We're to give freely to the Lord just as they were. What does that mean? That means that we give in proportion to what you have. In the Old Testament, what were they to give? They were to give the first 10%, the first fruits of what they had. God was not asking them to give a certain dollar amount. God wasn't asking them to give according to what somebody else had. God was asking them to give according to what they had. They were to give a percentage of their fruit, of their flock, of their land. Whatever they had, they were to give out of and in proportion to what they had. So in years, when they had a big harvest, they gave more. And in years of famine, they gave less because they were giving in proportion to what they had. God was not asking them to give according to what somebody else had. God was asking them to give in proportion to what they had. I think this is a principle that is still active for believers. What does God ask us to give? We give in proportion to what we have. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, encourages the church to set aside from what they have, to set aside some as a collection to help other believers. Paul's not asking them to give according to what somebody else has or or to give according to a certain dollar amount. Paul is asking them to set aside some of what they have. We give in proportion to to what we have. I remember we talked once to a young lady who said, you know, I really want to join the church. I've never been 
a member of a church, but I really want to be a member of a church. Uh, and I asked, why, why have you never joined a church? And she said, I'm just not sure that I could afford it. And my heart broke for her. I said, oh, I, I don't know what you've heard from other places, but that's, that's not how this works at all. But she had in her mind, in order to be a part of the church, there's a certain dollar amount. I've, I've got to pay the tax. I, I've got to be able to pay the membership dues, and I don't think I can, I can afford the membership dues. That is not what giving is. Giving is in proportion to what we have. And so some have more, and some give more, and some have less, and some give less. God is not asking us to give according to what somebody else has, or, getting, or give according to what somebody else expects of us. We give in proportion to what we have. That was what was expected in the Old Testament, what's expected of us now. And we give willingly from a generous heart. I hope if you've noticed anything about what God has been calling the people to throughout the book of Malachi, it is this. That God is saying, not only do I want your obedience, I want you to do what I've asked you to do, but what is God saying again and again and again? I want you to do it because you love me. I want you to do it because you value me, because you see my worth and my holiness, that God is telling them again and again that your obedience must be coupled with a right heart. We saw this earlier in in the book when they're still going through the motions of worship. They're bringing these animals. They're still offering sacrifices, but what is God saying? you're doing this. You're simply going through the motions. You're not doing this because you love me or want to worship me. It took for the the people in the Old Testament to bring the first fruits, to bring the first 10% of what you had to the Lord. Consider that in a time in which everyone is living basically hand to mouth. You are surviving and your family is surviving based on what you have. What trust it must have taken to come to the Lord and to bring your first fruits to bring the first 10% of what you had and to give it to the Lord, it took great trust. God is saying, I want you to give willingly from a generous heart, one that wants to give to me, that loves me, that comes in a heart of worship that, that God is saying to them, I care not just about what you give, but I care ultimately about your heart before me. The same is true of us. God is much, I think, much less concerned about the dollar amount of what you give and much more concerned about the heart by which you give it. Why? Because God is not after your money. God is after you. He desires that you would have a heart that would see him, that would understand his holiness, that would see his glory and would worship him so that he calls us to give willingly out of a heart that is generous towards the Lord, a heart that is Godward. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 7, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That when we give to the Lord, I think the New Testament makes clear, we're not given a tax. We're not paying a tax to God so that we can remain His, that we are called to give willingly out of a heart that loves God, a heart that is cheerful before the Lord, a, a heart that is Godward, that cares about the glory and the worth of the Lord. We're to give in proportion to what you have. Give willingly from a generous heart. And in this, we, we give as an act of worship. This is what God is calling them to do, that they are to give out of what they have willingly before the Lord as an act of worship before God. That in their giving, they are extolling his worth and his glory and his holiness. Remember, what does this, these tithes and offerings, what do they support? They support the temple. The temple is able to function because of their tithes and offerings. They're able to offer sacrifices. They're able to hold the feast and the celebrations that God has called them to keep that they can worship and celebrate partly because of their their faithfulness to give. That their giving before the Lord is an act of worship that demonstrates the faithfulness and the worthiness of God. Again, what God is calling them to is not about monetary value, but it's about worship. It is about his relationship with them that they give, not to go through the motions, but they give as an act of worship before God. As New Testament believers, every act of giving ought to be an act of worship. That in fact, I think this text has in mind a particular emphasis on, on what we do with our money, what we do with our resources. But the truth is that, that giving for New Testament believers is about much more than what we do with our money. That in fact, what we do with our money often is just a small picture and a reflection of what we are doing with all of our lives. What are we to do with all of our lives? We're to give it to the Lord. What does God ask of your life? Not 10%. What does God, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, what does God ask of your life? A hundred percent. This is why Paul is able to say in Romans chapter 12, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable God, which is your spiritual worship. That when we give to God, we give as an act of worship that involves much more than what we just do with our pocketbooks. It involves all of our life, our work, and our marriages, 
and our education and our kids and our friendships and our hobbies and every aspect of our life, we're called to lay before the Lord as a living offering, as an act of worship before God. It is not primarily about money. It is not about monetary value. It is about laying these things before the Lord as an act of worship. I've got at home in my dresser a stack of cards that my kids have written me throughout the years. If I offered to sell them to you, I doubt you would pay much for these cards that my children have written to me because they don't hold in the abstract, objectively, much monetary value. They mean a great deal to me because they come from my children. Because in the end, what matters to me and the reason I keep them is not because they're expensive or because they hold monetary value to the world. Why do I keep them? Because they've come from my children. Because they, they are demonstrations of the love that we have for one another and the relationship that we have. This is what giving is all about. It is about the relationship we have with God, about laying ourselves before him in a way that is an act of worship. This is why in Luke's gospel, do you remember the story when Luke uh, tells us the story of Jesus with his disciples and they're watching the people put in the money at the synagogue and what do the religious leaders do? They come through and they make sure everybody sees the, the big stacks of money. They, they went to the bank and they got all their, their money in rolls of dimes so that when they poured it in to the coffer that everyone would hear all the money that they're giving. They're, they're making sure that everybody sees what great amount of a gift that they're giving. And then as they're watching, who comes through? A widow who gives two small mites, two, two tiny coins, almost uh, uh, an amount so insignificant uh, that it, uh, almost to be worthless. And she puts that in, and Jesus makes sure that his disciples understood what just happened. He says, I want you to see, she gave more than all of them because she gave out of what she had. What is he saying to them? He's saying, it's not about the money. It's about your heart before the Lord. Why was her offering more meaningful? Why was it worth more before the Lord? Not because it was worth more financially, but because it came from a heart that was Godward. That she gave not to be seen by men, not to be applauded by men, not to feel better or to check a box, but she gave as an act of worship before the Lord. The call is to give freely to God in proportion to what we have, willingly from a generous heart as an act of worship before God. Let us give then freely, faithfully, generously to God. We want to be careful that we do not, as the Old Testament Israelites did, rob God and act in a way that is selfish or greedy or stingy, hoarding these things to ourselves. but let us freely give to the Lord as an act of worship before Him. Listen, I, I know that even thinking about this is difficult. It is hard, even for the most mature believers, to give freely to anybody, even the Lord. That even where there is great love and commitment towards the Lord, that giving sometimes is still very difficult. You know, if this has ever happened to you, sometimes we'll go through the drive-thru. And I want fries. And sometimes Hannah says she doesn't want fries. And then we get fries, and then she lied, because she did, <laughs> she did want fries. She just wanted my fries. And she eats, she begins to just borrow some of my fries. And I feel it in the moment. Here's a person whom I love. I love her. Everything I have is hers. Every, every dollar, I, everything is hers. My whole, I would die for her. I would lay down everything for her. Everything I have is hers. I just, not these fries. If you would just leave... <laughs> There is great love and great commitment, but it is easy to find yourself in this selfish, self-protective, get off of my stuff. <laughs> this is true even when we love and are committed greatly to the Lord, that we're selfish and we're stingy. And we begin to think, if I give freely to the Lord, what might happen to me? If I actually give to God, if I'm free, if I, if I give as an act of worship, I lay myself down before the Lord. What, what, if I, what, what if I run out? What, what will happen to me if I lay my life freely before the Lord? This is difficult. What I want you to see is what God does throughout the text is not just this bare call to bring your tithes and offerings, but God grounds this call for their tithes and offerings, their tithes and contributions in his own character. That what we do with our money tells us a lot about our theology. What we do, not just with our money, but with our time and our efforts and our marriages and our kids and our jobs, what we do with our lives says a lot about what we think about God. And so God is not just calling them to, to, to give to him, but God is saying, give to me 
And you'll be okay. I, I want you to see this, this uh, nature that uh, you're giving to, this God that you're giving to. So we can give to God first because God can be trusted. That he's giving us the grounds by which we can trust that if we will lay ourselves freely before him, to give in proportion to what we have and from our uh, willing heart and as an act of worship, we can give to God because God can be trusted. He is a God who is faithful. Look at the way the text begins. Verse 6, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. What is God saying to them? The only reason you're not consumed right now is because I'm faithful. The only reason you have not been burnt up by my judgment is because I am faithful even when you have not been. He says, you have left me every generation, right? O oh, children of Jacob, uh, from the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. God has said, you have been faithless in every generation, but what? God says, I have been faithful. The only reason you're not burnt up is my faithfulness and my mercy and my love. Oh, I, I do not change. I keep faithful love for a thousand generations. I can be trusted. And even this, he says, oh, won't you return to me? Consider all the ways that we have seen that the Israelites have failed God post-exile. All the ways that Malachi lays out, all the ways that Ezra and Nehemiah lay out that they have failed before the Lord. And what is God doing? He's still in grace and in mercy drawing them back. He's showing steadfast love and faithfulness. He's inviting them to return to him. Oh, return to me that I might return to you. God is saying to them, does it feel to you like I have been distant? God is saying, I didn't go anywhere. You have left me. You have run far from me. In fact, you are worthy of judgment, but because I do not change, because I am faithful and loving and merciful, you are not consumed. Remember, it takes great faith to give to the Lord. I think that the real problem in Malachi's day was not that they had a giving problem, they had a faith problem. They didn't trust God. And so God, in leading them to, to, to be faithful in their tithes and offerings, begins here, you can trust me. I am a God that does not change. When you give to me, you can trust that I will provide for you, that I will take care of you, that I didn't go anywhere, but that you walked far from me. If we give to God, we can give trusting that God can be trusted. That the same thing is true, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 13, 8. That the only reason that we are not consumed by the judgment of God is this, that God does not change. If you are here and you are a believer, you've repented of your sins and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, how do you know that at the end of your life or at the end of all things, how do you know that when you stand before the Lord, you will be saved and not condemned? Because God does not change. And he keeps his promises. That is the only reason we are not consumed. That he can be trusted. He is calling us to himself that we might walk in faithfulness. That whatever you give to God, whatever, your time, your money, your marriage, your life, your job, all of you, whatever you give to God, give trusting that God will handle it wisely. For God can be trusted. Trust that God will provide for you, that he is gracious and merciful and loving. We give, we can give, because God can be trusted. Number two, we give because God owns everything. That when we give to God, we give trusting that he'll handle it wisely, and we give trusting that we are giving God back what already belongs to him. This is true throughout the Old Testament. God says to them, you are robbing me. You are taking what does not belong to you, but rightfully belongs to me. What is God reminding them? Everything belongs to him. How do they have anything in the first place to give to God? They only have it because God has given it to them. Who brought them into the land? God did. Who kept them in the land? God did. Who spit them out of the land? God did. Who brought them back into the land? God did. Who sends the rains for their harvest? Who provides what they need to feed their cattle? Who keeps their cattle alive? Who keeps their, their wine presses flowing? Who keeps them afloat? God does. And so God says, when you withhold what I have called you to give, you are robbing me, for it rightly belongs to me. In fact, all things belong to God. That their tithes under the Old Testament were an acknowledgement, not just that God was their king, but that God really owned everything. 
that they really ought to be giving 100%, but they're only giving what God has called them to give, that they are reminded, Psalm 50, verse 10, that the cattle on a thousand hills belongs to him. Everything belongs to God. That we give acknowledging, not just that some of what we have belongs to God, but we give acknowledging that everything belongs to God. James says in James chapter 1, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Do you think about that in your day to day? That every good gift you have ever received, every good thing that you have ever experienced in this life is a gift of grace from God. Nothing is due to you. You own nothing. God owns everything. Everything we have is a gift of God that God asks us to give back. Everything belongs to Him. He owns everything. Uh, next week is Father's Day. I suspect, I hopefully, unless this week goes very poorly, I'll get a Father's Day gift for my kids next week. My kids are young enough that I know when I, when I get that box and I begin to unwrap it or open up that bag, I know whatever's in there, I paid for, right? That <laughs> they're young enough, they don't have jobs, that, that this is a gift that is coming out of my account. Now, I don't hold that against them at all. In fact, it matters not at all to me. It doesn't matter at all to me. They're my children. They, they give to me, and I'm happy to give to them that out of what I've given to them, they give back to me. Listen, everything you have ever given to God came out of his account. Everything. God owns everything, belongs to him, and so we give only out of what God has graciously and mercifully given to us. It is all of grace. And if we think about it that way, that everything really already belongs to God, it gets much easier to hold everything with open hands. If all of my life belongs to God, if every dollar I've ever had, every moment of my life, every heartbeat, every breath in my lungs, every day in my life, every day in my job, in my marriage, my children, my career, if everything that I've ever been given is a gift of God and it all belongs to God, it makes it much easier to hold everything with an open hand and to say, Lord, it's all yours anyway. Do with it what you will, because everything belongs to you. God can be trusted, and God owns everything, and we give because God gives generously. I want you to see what he says in the text. God says, essentially to them, I want you to be faithful, and I want you to know I am eager to pour out my blessing upon you. God is calling them to be faithful because he wants to pour out blessing upon them. He wants to remove the, remove the curse. In Deuteronomy chapter, eight, or ch chapter 28, as well as other places, God laid out for them, here are the stipulations of the covenant. And if you keep the covenant, here's the blessings that will come. And if you violate the covenant, here's the curses that will come. They have experienced these. One of the curses is that you'll be spit out of the land. They've already experienced this. They've been brought back now because of God's mercy. But God has told them, if you fail to keep the covenant, one of the things I'm going to do is put a curse on your land. Put a curse on your cattle. I'm going to curse you because of your failure. God says, oh, would you be faithful? I am eager to remove the curse that already sits upon you that I might pour out blessing upon you. The language he says there is fascinating for Old Testament language. He says in verse 10, and thereby put me to the test. I'll bring the full tithe into my house and put me to the test. Now, most of the time in the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, to test the Lord was a dangerous thing. You were not to test the Lord. In fact, people are punished in the scriptures for testing the Lord. There are only a few times in which God invites the people of God to test them. God says to them, well, won't you be faithful? Test me. God says, try me out and see if I won't bless you. Test me and see if I'm, if I'm gracious and generous and kind. I want to remove the curse that I might pour out blessings. Notice the, the phrases that he uses. He says, test me and see if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. That, that phrase, the, the opening of the windows of heaven, one of the only other times that is used in the, in the Hebrew Old Testament is to speak of the flood of Noah's day. When the windows of heaven opened, when water covered the entire planet, and God uses that same language to say, oh, test me and see if the blessings that I pour out on you won't be like the flood of Noah. That I'm going to open up the heavens and pour so many blessings upon you that you will no longer have any need. That I am going to forsake, to, to curse the, not you, but I'm going to literally curse the destroyer, the locust, the, the things that I have sent to destroy your harvest. God said, I will send them away that you might be faithful and fruitful before me. God makes clear that his desire is to be generous with his people. Try me, 
and see if I'm not generous, the Lord says. Test me and see if you don't enjoy the blessing that I pour out upon you. He wants both things, their glory or his glory and their good. These two things go together that as they seek his glory that they will find in that their own good. Now, as we think about what this means for us to live in the new covenant, we have to be careful to walk cautiously as we think about what does this mean for us. In fact, many throughout church history have not walked cautiously as they've thought about this and have gone, I think, into great error. That in the Old Testament, and in the old, under the Old Covenant, one of the ways that God demonstrated his blessing for the people was often in physical blessing. Not that they weren't blessed spiritually, but it was in things like uh, rich harvest and, and healthy animals and, and healthy bodies and material possessions. And often what people have done then is to say, well, it must then work the same way in the New Covenant. And so we have many who, who have taken passages like Malachi 3 and said, oh, if you'll just give to the Lord, then God will bless you abundantly physically. Oh, if you'll sow $10, God will give you 1000 If you sow 1000 God will give you 10000 If you sow 10000 God will give you 100000 If you'll just give to God of your money, if you'll just give physically, then you will be healthy and wealthy and prosperous, that God will bless you in all of these physical ways. Now, we have to understand that that is not the testimony of the New Testament, that in fact, things are different in the New Covenant. That the, the promise for physical blessing is there, but it's there differently than it is in the Old Covenant. Now, we have to ask, well, does that mean then that God does not bless us in the New Covenant, those who are believers in Christ on this side of the cross? Is there no physical blessing for us? No, I don't think that's what the New Testament teaches us at all. At all. I think, in fact, there are lots of blessings that God gives to us out of his grace and out of his generosity. Are you here today with breath in your lungs? Is your heart beating? Do you have clothes on your back? Do you have a house to go home to? Do you have food to eat? Are you relatively healthy? Have you ever drank a Dr. Pepper? All these things are (laughs) good gifts that God gives to us in this life. There are real physical blessings. Every physical blessing you enjoy in this life is a gift of God. But what the New Testament teaches is that all of those pale in comparison to the fullness of the blessing that will come at the end. It is not that God has undermined all the physical blessings in the new covenant. It's that God has said they're coming, and they're coming in their fullness, but they're only coming when Jesus comes. That one day, we will be healthy, wealthy, and prosperous. One day, we will inherit not just a strip of land in the Middle East. What will we inherit? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? For they shall inherit the earth. That when the Lord Jesus comes, he's bringing with him a new heaven and a new earth. That he is going to put the sun away for God himself will be our God and he will be our son. He will wipe away every tear and there will be no no more sin and no more sickness and no more death. We will experience the physical blessings of the Old Testament in their fullness one day when Jesus comes and we get a preview here. God is gracious and merciful to give us glimpses of that promise here and now. He is not teaching in the New Testament that if we, we just give a certain amount of money, if we just live faithfully enough... As long as you trust God enough, you won't get cancer. If you give enough to the church, you'll be rich. You'll never lose your job. That is not the promise of the New Testament. The promise is that if we will be faithful before the Lord, that in his generosity and in his grace, he will pour out rich blessing on us. And yet in this new covenant, we see that blessing most not in our physical blessings. We see that blessing most in the spiritual blessings that God has poured out upon us. This is what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, that God has blessed us in Christ with what? Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. What is the primary means by which we understand the blessing of God, the generosity of God? It is not physically, it is spiritually before the Lord. This is what we we saw in the letter to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 4 when when Paul has been calling them to lay their whole lives before the Lord. He says in chapter 4 verse 19, and my God will supply every need of yours according to what? His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. That it's in Christ that God provides for us. That's why Paul can say in Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 31 and 32, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? What does Paul say? If God gave his own son for you, how can you not trust that he will graciously give you everything you need. That the blessing and the generosity of God is seen in our life, not in what kind of car we drive, or how much money is in our bank account, 
or how healthy we are or how big our retirement account is or what job we do or what honor and applause we receive in this life. The blessing of God in this life, the generosity of God and the grace of God in this life is seen most clearly in this, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. That is the generosity of God. He has demonstrated it most in the life and the death and the resurrection of his son for sinners. How do we know that God will take care of us? Paul says we look to the cross. If he has given his own son for you, how will he not graciously give you all things? The generosity of God is seen in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So how do we give to God? We give often sometimes fearful. What if I give to God? What if I give too much? What will happen to me if I give? Trust, you can never outgive God. For he can be trusted. All things already belong to him, and God gives generously to us. All that we have, we give to Christ, and we trust that God will never run out. If you are sometimes afraid that you might give too much to the Lord, either of your time or your effort or your money or all of your life, maybe you feel like maybe giving, you might give too much to God, trust always that God is more generous than you. We never outgive God. God can be trusted. We give because of this theology. We give because of the character of God. Thus, in our giving, we are always pointing people to the Lord. That we give freely to the Lord. We can give because this is who God is, and thus we give, thirdly, for the glory of the Lord. Notice what, what uh, Malachi does by the Lord. He does the same thing at the end of this passage that he has done n- in nearly every passage. That as he's calling the people of Israel to walk in faithfulness, what does he tell them? That your faithfulness before the Lord is going to do what? It is going to point the nations to me. He said this, you, you'll walk in faithfulness, you'll honor me and trust my love. What, is he gonna, what does he say back in chapter 1? The nations will see and rejoice. They'll come and worship me. God says in verse 12, Then all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. That he's implying that as they see the blessing of God poured out on the people of God because of their faithful giving, God will be glorified. Not just in Israel, but God will be glorified in all the nations. That we give for the glory of God, number one, as an evidence of our faith. That we give, and in our giving, we demonstrate that we trust God. We demonstrate that what we say we believe is what we actually believe, that God can be trusted, that we give for the glory of God. This was always the plan, both for Old Testament Israel and for New Testament believers, that by their faithfulness, by demonstrating their faith in this one true God, that they might draw the nations to see the glory of this God, that in their giving, they would evidence their faith in God and the nations might be drawn in. We give to the glory of God that by our faith, we might draw others to trust this same God, to see that he can be trusted, that he is faithful and merciful and gracious, that all things will already belong to him, and yet he generously has poured out his grace on us in the personal work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We evidence that faith by the way we give before him. We give as a testimony of his goodness. To these saying, by the way you give, by the way you walk in faithfulness to me, the nations are going to look at you and say what? Oh, they are blessed. The, the word, it's the same word from Psalm 1. It's the same, uh, it's the Hebrew version of the word that Jesus uses in the Sermon on the Mount for blessed. It's, it's happy. Well, what a happy nation they are. That they'll see the goodness that I pour out upon you and they'll see your happiness. They will call you the land of delight. What, what is the implication there? They'll want to come and receive the same happiness. They'll want to come and walk in the land of the light that they might come to join the nation of Israel that they might know and understand the glory of God and bask in his blessing and bask in his favor. We give to God that the world may see his glory. That they may look at us and say, what a happy people they are that they give to the Lord freely, and yet they live in the land of the light, that they, the light that they might be drawn in. Listen, test the Lord. Try him and see if he doesn't pour out his goodness on you. Hold your life and your work and your money and everything you have. Hold it loosely with open hands before the Lord and see if the unbelievers in your life don't notice. We live in a world It is all about the pursuit of money. We live in a world that has idolized money, that that the, the world around us is all about how much money can you make and how fast can you make it and how much can you have. If we as the people of God live with an open hand with everything before the Lord, what we do is put a big sign on our life that says God is better than money. Where is happiness found? Not in a bank account. Where do we find ourselves walking in the land of delight? It is not in the toys that we get in this life. It is the goodness of God poured out upon his people. 
Our delight is not in our money or in our cars or in our houses or in our careers or our vacations. Our delight is in the Lord. We give to the glory of God. Does your life demonstrate the goodness of God that others may be drawn in and see his glory? God is calling them and I think calling us that as we wait for the fullness of God to come, as we wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to come, to bring the new heaven and the new earth, to put away sin and death and hell, to bring all the promises to their fullness, he is calling us to wait faithfully and to give freely to the Lord out of a faith that is all about the glory of God. I don't want you to miss that even in this call to give faithfully, to, to walk faithfully in their tithes and offerings before the Lord, that nestled in this is the call not to merely give faithfully, but what is God doing? It is the call to return to him. Oh, for generations, he says, you have all left me. Oh, return to me that I might return to you. What is God after? Not the bottom line. God is after the relationship with him. What does God want? He wants them. A few years ago, my kids figured out how to call me from the Alexa at home. It's not that funny. I don't... It actually provides a lot of distraction sometimes. And so I get a lot of calls during the day. It comes in on my phone as Hannah Parrish, and so I'll always answer, and it's never her. Uh, it's, it's them. Uh, I was reminded this week, uh, even as I was finishing the sermon, one, one day this week, one afternoon, I got a call from Hannah Parrish, and I answered, and it was Henry. I'm in this part of the sermon, working on this, and Henry's asking, when, when are you going to be home? Well, bud, in a little while I'll be home. Well, what time? Well, I got a couple more things to do. Well, how many things do you got to do? Well, well, what are you going to do? Well, hey, but I'm going to pack up soon. I'll be home. Okay, well, when, you, how many more th- what, when are you going to pack up? And when you do leave, how long will it take you to get home? <laughs> you, if you, need, you need to let me know what time you leave, and I'll set a timer so that I know when you're going to be home, and I'll wait on the front porch for you. And it just went on. Eventually, I was like, hey, but I love you, but if we keep having this conversation, it's going to be longer. I got to get off. And, and there is sometimes a frustration, right? A, it is an interruption to the day, and then you realize this. He doesn't really care about all the things I got to do. He's not asking really or concerned about the mileage or exactly what time it will take me to get home. He's not even particularly interested in what's left on my to-do list before I get home. What's his goal? He just wants his dad home. He just wants to be with me. He's just eager to be around me and to have me home. Listen, I want you to see This text is not a desperate God begging for funds. This is not a God who is desperate for the money of his people. This is a gracious and a loving and a faithful God who was pleading with them to come to him in faith. This is the invitation of the text. Not that God needs your money, but that God is worthy of your glory. We give not because God is needy, but we give because God is worthy. This is the invitation. Do you want to know the unchanging love of God? Then give out of the overflow of his grace that he has poured out on you in the Lord Jesus Christ. Give to the glory of God.